At Zilla, we are dedicated to the innovation of caging, lighting, and equipment solutions that provide proper husbandry for your pet's long and happy life. To see our entire catalog, visit ZillaRules.com. Hey, what's up, Rattler? So right now, I'm going to do an Emerald Tree Boa episode here in Des Moines with Tom Widener. Emerald Tree Boas are one of my favorite boas, and when I was in Peru, we looked really hard for them, and, well, obviously, we didn't see it, as you guys know from watching the Peruvian episodes, but here at Tom's, he works with these snakes almost exclusively, so let's go check out some awesome Emerald Tree Boas. I'm Dave Kaufman and I am obsessed with reptiles. And I have been since I was nine years old. 25 years later, I made a trilogy of award-winning movies about them. Now my life is all about touring the world in search of them in wild places and checking out some of the most awesome breeding facilities and reptile expos while I'm at it. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. All right, Tom, so I have never seen a collection like this. Show us everything. Okay, well, we can start right here, I guess, as good as any. This is what they call a pattern muslin. Wow. I first started breeding these things back in you know, the early 70s. And what I found, getting these out of the wild, I could breed them to a normal one and get babies that were both. Or breeding this to another patternless one, you'll get patternless ones. So, but it is definitely something that occurs in the wild. There's another phase called the anaconda phase, which will have, instead of the white crossbars, there'll be black crossbars across here. Here's a, an interesting color morph. This is a normal northern, but the yellow is uh, somewhat unusual. And now how, how old would a snake that size be? I can tell you that snake was born in it's six years old. Six years old, okay. Mm -hmm. It'd be really nice if she was gravid. This is what everybody's after. This is a, a basin. It's actually a different species. This is Bates Eye. Nice part about these, they don't bite. Yeah, because, you know, they kind of have a reputation of sometimes being snappy. Yes, they do. But these guys, in general, unless you really provoke them, they don't bite. This is a unique one. I force fed this animal for four years. So you force fed this animal for four years? Mm -hmm. Before she finally started eating on her own. I have a brother of hers that he started feeding a little sooner. I think when I force fed him about two and a half years. So are they pretty temperamental eaters? Or was, was this just an individual one that just didn't really take off right away? The prey has to be warm. And if it's not warm, as it turns out, that apparently was what was wrong here because the cage was warm enough that she couldn't pick the prey out of the background. What you want to look for is a continuous stripe joining all of the crossbars. Now, some of them are broken up a little bit. They may not be completely contiguous, but this uh, is the characteristic of these guys. In the hybrids, generally, you will not see that. Gotcha. I see this one has a lot of yellow on its belly. Is that another kind of di diagnostic feature of it? Yeah, I think so. Um, if you look at the northerns in here, almost all of them are white underneath or cream colored. And the basins tend to be yellow. And so this snake being at this size, how old is this snake? <laughs> a lot older than she should be this, for that size. She's seven years old. Seven years old. Well, you said you had to force feed her for, yes, you know, years. four years. These are more basins. Same again. Continuous stripe. Right. Good disposition. Okay, so for people that don't know, the basins are from what area of South America? Further south, Brazil primarily. Uh, I think I've, I've seen a couple that came out of Peru that look like this. I'm not sure the exact range or where it breaks up, but ones out of Peru are very, very hard to come by. All right, so obviously another basin. Yep. Now, this has got a wider stripe, which when you get down to the technicalities of it, some people like the wider stripe. It's all a matter of taste. And you Absolutely. You can have about anything you want with these things now as we're succeeding in captive breeding them. Yeah, and he's actually my favorite one right now here, I think. The trick with babies and with young ones is you've got to have small perches. If you don't have small perches, you're going to get kink tails in these things. You'd be amazed in the wild at how small branches they choose to hang out on. And that's a mistake we've made for years, is giving them too big of perches. 
Gotcha. Traditionally in captivity, in my experience, they will go as high as they can go in the cage. So height is more of a first choice for them than perch size. So if you make a big perch up high, they'll go up there and spend their time on it. Not because it's the right size perch, just because it's as high as they can go. I kind of run the infirmary for things that don't necessarily turn out right. And uh, if you can look close at the end of her nose, she has a double cleft. Normally, this would be euthanized, but being who I am, I can't bring myself to intentionally kill an emerald. I'm exactly with you there on any snake. How's she eating? I mean, is she, is that cleft she bothering eat, her? Yeah, uh, yes. She has a hard time eating anymore, so uh, the yes. question of how long she's gonna make it. She's in good health for her size, but she should be a big adult female now. Wow, well, she's in good hands with you. Well, she's lived this long anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, here is a hybrid. Generally, what you see with a hybrid is the reduced saddles or crossbars. In a hybrid, that solid li white line just completely disappears. Yes, most of the time. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's always exceptions. <laughs> yes, there always is. It's a nice animal because you can get about anything you want. This one tends to be a darker, darker green, dark on the back, which makes the white stand out more. Uh, mostly in the eye of the beholder, whatever you like. You can find in these things. Absolutely. Oh, see, now this is, when I think about an emerald, this is what I kind of have in mind. This is like a stereotypical basin, yeah. isn't it? She's opaque, deep opaque. She's getting ready to shed, so she's a little darker than you would normally yeah. see. But, but she's also gravid, so. They've got the most interesting heads of any boa. Oh, and interesting teeth if you get bit. I'm so. sure, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, that you have really long noses for boas. Yes. Wow. Some people think that's one of the defining characteristics of them is that they have a longer head than what the northerns have. Sure, I sure. That's really true, but I just raise these things. A <laughs> right. <laughs> it fascinated me. I've had them. I got my first ones probably in about 68 or 69 and uh, fell in love with them. And uh, I've had them more or less ever since. This collection has waxed and waned over the years. But sure. I decided about five years ago that I was done with everything else for the most part and I wanted to concentrate on these. Good reason for this is with so many of them, you can do about anything in these cages in the daytime, they won't bother you, even the ones that bite. And so my wife can clean the cages during the day. And that helps tremendously. So. All right, so back in 68 or 69, what could you buy? Uh Emerald four. The basins that now sell for thousands of dollars, I could buy for twenty-five dollars. Twenty-five. That's, this is exactly what I thought. Yes. <laughs> twenty-five, thirty-five, and forty-five was the price range, and that just depended on the size. That had nothing to do with the color or anything else on them. Jeez. It was ridiculous. It's almost like I wish I didn't even know that. Right. Exactly. Personally, I like the basins better. <laughs> Most people do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest problem is these are a heck of a lot more expensive than the northerns. So. All right, so on that note, what would a, the average basin cost? Anywhere from $2,500 up to $17,000, $18,000. Oh, is that right? Baby, so they, they're, baby they're pretty sizable. Yeah. They're still pretty spendy. And it pretty much determined about what you like, how wide the stripe is, whether it's continuous and that sort of stuff. Um, generally, what the uh, breeders tend to do is price the stuff they don't want to part with really high. But then somebody will come along and say, okay, what's your item want to sell at price? And then we'll buy it, so. All right, so an adult in any one of these cages, what would the value of those be? I would not sell a breeding size female basin for less than $20,000. That's what I was kind of thinking. Most all of these guys feed upon rats. Uh, there are a couple around here that are real cowards that are just mouse feeders. Um, I don't know if coward is the right word to use, but they prefer mice over rats. Size of the prey is very influential on them. I can hand this one a rat that it will whirl around and take a look at and then won't take it. And then I realize it's too big. So get a smaller rat, she'll, he'll take it. They feed here primarily at night. We feed after the lights go out, about a half hour after the lights go out. Uh, it's traditionally what they do anyway in the wild. They're pretty sedentary creatures in the daytime. At night, they go looking for food. I've heard reports of 
in mangrove areas, for example, where they come out at night, they hang down over the trails that the rats are running back and forth on and grab their food off of the trails. So I'm sure a lot of it has to do with when their prey is active. That's what I was thinking, and that makes a lot of sense. So, and it holds true. I mean, you could you can try to feed these guys in the daytime here. I, you'd be lucky to get half a dozen of them to eat in the daytime. Now, part of that's conditioning because that's when they get fed here. But uh, whatever it is, it's easier to feed them at night than it is in the daytime. Gotcha. And I learned early on with the very first emerald that I ever had, back in those days, we heated aquariums with light bulbs. Right. So I had an emerald that fed, did well for a while, and then all of a sudden it started not eating and downhill and everything else. And to this day, I'm sure it's because that it was 24 hours a day under light. What is the process that you use to get these guys to breed? Do you cycle them? Is it light cycles? Is it temperature cycles? Um, I don't have an exact answer for that. What we do here is we uh, light cycle them and temperature cycle them. Temperature cycle is somewhat risky with these things because you can get too low of a temperature. I, they can take a spike temperature, especially if you ship them in the wintertime, and it doesn't seem to bother many. But if you give them consistently low temperatures, every day they need to be able to get back up to about mid-80s to 90 degrees for a period of time. If you don't do that, chances are you're going to have problems with them. You may get breeding out of them, but somewhere down the way you're going to get a respiratory problem. And so we're trying to develop a protocol, if you will, but it's not easy. Yeah, I can imagine. Now, are you emulating a wet and a dry season with them? A little bit. Uh, and in this part of the world, it's kind of tough because you want the wet season during breeding season, and that's the worst time of the year. It's winter time. Exactly. So, exactly. It's low outside. Now, everything in here is on an automatic misting system, so I can adjust them any way that I want to. So. so in other words, what you're saying is that if you want to work with these, you cannot go to a forum on Facebook and read a couple of posts and become a professional at breeding these emeralds. You have to put in the time. I hope it's not that easy for all of what it's cost me to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Someday it probably will be. Right. I, you know, I go back to in fact, I'm the, I have the credit, according to Dick Ross, of being the first pre person to bred blood pythons in captivity. Okay. That goes back when we knew nothing about breeding any of this stuff. So, right. Uh, it's been a long learning curve, and these people today now have the advantage of that, all of that knowledge that was gained along the way, that they can get good information from somebody else, or I, I hesitate to say off the internet, but the information's out there. People have bred just about anything they've set out to do. That's correct, yeah, yeah. Well, sure I, wasn't that way in the old days. I remember, you know, just, what, 20 years ago, ball pythons were coming in, they were full of ticks, they were full of mites, and no one knew how to breed these things. And I remember talking to, actually, who is now a really popular and very well-known ball python breeder, and I got a pair in, and I called him up and I said, hey, do you know how to breed ball pythons? He says, why would you want to breed a ball python? Nobody wants to breed ball pythons. And now he is one of the most well-known ball python breeders out there. So I know exactly what you're talking about with putting in the time and, you know, trial and error is a big, you know, path to success with not only these, but with any snake that you're working with. The problem with something like this, and it was with ball pythons in the beginning, that people are willing to pay a lot of money for this. So that being the case, why should I tell you how to be successful with these things. Right. I, you know, I'm 75 years old. I don't much care anymore about that sort of right, stuff. Right, right. So. so what you're saying is everything that you've said in this video is wrong, is what? <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. All right, Tom, so people that are just starting out with emeralds, what advice do you have for them? Make sure you get the proper setup. Do your research first. They need proper humidity. Uh, you need to understand pretty much the way they do around here. They feed at night. They feed on a uh, little larger prey animal as a baby than you think they would, and that's the reason because it needs to generate that heat signature that they can detect. They will not take something that's cold. Um, preferably, they like live stuff to begin with, and you can get them off on frozen thawed, but it takes a little bit. Uh, humidity is very important. If they're not shedding properly, you don't have enough humidity. They do not like to be sprayed directly. If you set up an automatic system to spray them, 
make sure you're spraying the interior of the cage and not necessarily on the animal. If you spray the animal, oftentimes it will lead to lowering body temperature, which leads to respiratory problems if you do it on a regular basis. And besides, they just don't like to be sprayed. If you set it up to spray, they will try to get away from it. Now, we spray them occasionally in the rain chamber if we're having trouble shedding or something like that, where they can't get away from it, but they don't like it. So handle them very little until you get them feeding. You can tame a baby down. A baby basin will be more than likely be tamed. Uh, a northern baby probably won't be tamed, but you can tame them down. You can tame anything down. You can, you can tame animals of any species, but not necessarily every animal of that species. So just be a little careful. Uh, consider them delicate animals in the beginning. They really aren't. They're very hardy once you get them established. I've had them live 25 years for me, so. Gotcha, so this is not a beginner species at all, is it? I would say not. I would be very reluctant to make this somebody's, you know, first half a dozen snakes to be one of these. You need to, you just need the experience of keeping animals. Gotcha, and you, more success. yeah, you have 50 years of experience behind you in these <laughs> and, yeah. It shows. This is an amazing place. So Rattlers, there it is. This is a species of snake that is incredibly rewarding, but it's not for everybody, and it certainly is not a very good beginner snake. They're awesome snakes, but work with a bunch of other snakes that are very similar to these snakes before you take that dive into working with emerald tree boas. So I'm going to be out here driving through the Great Plains. I'm going to be doing some herping. I'm going to film some more episodes. going to do some collabs with some other awesome YouTubers. So until the next adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on. <laughs>